This call is being recorded. The phone was acting up a little bit. I had a hard time. You know, the, there you go. Okay, it's a lot better now. Hey, so what, um, I'm trying to remember where we left off yesterday. I was re-watching the video, and it was about halfway through. I know we were talking about Marilyn Monroe and Britney Spears and all that. What was going to be, what was going to be our second, our second topic? Well, I wanted to reiterate just a little bit. I was listening over our inter our last interview, too, and the interviews that we do were doing are so great because, I think first and foremost, it's proving to the common person on the street they can create their own media outlet. And I just want to yeah. congratulate you. You know, we we got to pat ourselves on the back, even though the caller, the the, the the even though our viewers aren't really donating as we would expect for the wealth of knowledge we've been delivering. We have, you know, they're not going to get this on CNN. Right. That's just the facts. And, you know, I was listening over our interview, and I was amazed at the knowledge people don't know. People saw Martha, Martha Stewart go to prison. They didn't know Wesley Snipes went to prison. Mm-hmm. They didn't know the, they didn't know uh, Mr. Biggs or Ron Isley went to prison from the Isley brothers. They didn't know, um, you know, all these people over the years. Uh, even uh, remember Tim Allen from Home Improvement? Yeah, he went, he went to prison for cocaine before he got his career back, right? Yeah, yeah. People, people sometimes, you know, I, I, I've had, I've had, um, I've had detractors in the past sit there and talk about me from like 15, when I was 17 years old. Me and some young preppy kids stole some beer out of a garage, put, and I got put on probation for it, and I ended up I violated the probation, which is easy to do at 17, you know. And right. I ended up in prison for, you know, for a short period. And I've had hecklers over the years just sit there and, you know, talk about I'm a criminal for stealing some beer out of a garage when I was 17. And mm-hmm. people say, people say, oh, my God, Jamil, you were in jail? You went to prison? I said, yeah, okay. Tim Allen from Home Improvement went through the same prison I did. Right. Tim Allen went to the penitentiary over cocaine dealing. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, you are, and that's that's what's so ludicrous about this is that people are getting heckled for things that you know we already know substance abuse or anything like that is something that's controversial as far as the sentencing laws. They're putting people you know in jail for you know smoking weed or having like an ounce on them, or you know, I mean, if you're drinking and driving, then yeah, you deserve yeah. to go, yeah, you, know, you know, but. Tim Allen was in prison, and I like Tim Allen, by the way. This isn't in any way a, a put down on Tim Allen. I think Tim Allen is a spectacular actor. I love – my grandfather loved his show, uh, Home Improvement. I used to watch the Tim Allen show all the time. It was a Detroit show. I'm from Michigan. I really enjoy Tim, all Tim Allen's work in the film industry. But when people say, you were in jail, you went to prison, I say, you know what? Yeah, I went to the penitentiary, but I went to the same penitentiary Tim Allen went to. You know – Get real. And, yeah. and uh, every time I go down, we were talking about, I, w- I would love to go down uh, almost every year, all all throughout the year, I go down on the, you know, Sunset Strip. You know where the Laugh Factory is? You said the Sunset Strip in what looks? The Sunset Strip is in West Hollywood by the house. You got the House of Blues right there. Then you got the Whiskey Go-Go, which was famous for way back in the 60s with the doors was, uh, uh, you know, the, the mamas and the papas and the doors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and uh, they used to all go to Whiskey Go-Go. Whiskey Go-Go was huge in the 60s, right below Laurel Canyon. And next to the, the House of Blues over there by, that's called the playground, where all the stars go late at night on the weekends and stuff. And they got the Laugh Factory in the comedy store. And Tim Allen's from Michigan. And he's he's so famous at the Laugh Factory on West Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> and I used to go down there and hang out and have drinks and stuff. You know the Asian guy from Mad TV? Yeah. What's his name? Jimmy? What's his name? Uh, I think it's Jimmy. I, um, yeah, he is so funny. The little Asian guy from Mad TV. I remember I, was, mm-hmm. I used to go down there and watch him do comedy on stage. 
at the uh, it was at oh, the comedy great. store right there. Yeah. And oh, I yeah, used man, to go in awesome. there. Yeah, yeah, I used to go in there in West Hollywood and and what you know, he's a famous uh he's famous on Mad T V. On Fox I used to go in there and after he did his comedy show I used to I, I would say hi to him and talk to him a little bit. He was such a funny guy. He those guys at the those guys down there at the comedy show, they they they're so funny. He he used to have all these jokes about being Asian and how his parents expected him to get higher test scores because he was he was hilarious. He was hilarious. I got cousins who are Asian, married into the family, so I, I he, he he blew my mind. He had me laughing so hard. But is it you know I guess I decided to look for him just because I feel like I've there's been a lot of Asian actors that I might get him confused with. Um, is it is his name Robert Lee Jr. I don't, I don't, he, I just know he's an Asian guy. I don't, I couldn't tell you his name for nothing. I just know he's an Asian guy on that TV. But, uh, yes, uh, it says, it's, this is him, but says he's a Korean, Korean descent, and he was like on Mad TV from 2001 to 2009. He was in like Harold and Kumar Argo at White Castle, too. He was in Pineapple Express, The Dictator. Right, yeah, right. I couldn't, he's familiar. I couldn't tell. Right, but, but uh, we, you know, that's kind of like where we left off on the last interview was we were talking about Britney Spears and the movie industry and all that stuff. And there's so, you know, you can just go down the line. And, hell, people think famous people got it easy. There's so many famous people who are who, who've been in and out of jail. I mean, look at Martin mm-hmm. Luther King. Martin Luther King was in jail more than anybody. Mm-hmm. And all he did was be black. He was in jail just because he was black. And Martin Luther King was in jail every week. Right. He he was just doing his his, his reach out work, and then you got uh, what was it? Robert Downey Jr. had his heroin addiction. Man, he was in the pen for like it was more than a couple of years. It was actually a long time. Right. And right. it was a big deal when he got out and got his career back. Right. 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 Yeah, you got all kinds. Of, you hell. Yeah. All kinds of people in showbiz into prison. Uh, that's that's nothing new. And so people right. say, oh, I, you know, Jamil got some interviews. He's on the internet. And he was in jail. Okay, well, there's a lot of other famous people. I, you know, there's you you got to explain stuff to people like they're stupid in today's world. You know what right. I mean? Yeah, I do because it's the same thing as um, you know, we've talked on touched on other subjects that we don't you know, do as targeting stuff and there's a lot of people who say well you know they got a section they got a section they were in the middle hospital so therefore it must not be true and that, it's the same thing with yeah. celebrities it's like saying well you went to prison Martha Stewart went to prison so I'm not going to make any of her recipes anymore I might catch a virus from her and like go to prison myself it's just like but, weird superstitious Mar- thinking and Martha Stewart when I was growing up I ended up going to uh, Grand Haven High School for part of the time I was growing up in Grand Haven, Michigan. And uh, I remember Martha Stewart owned a house, I believe, in downtown Grand Haven. She owned a summer house down there. I don't know if she ever went there or not, but she supposedly owned the house, and all my friends were talking about it. And I, Martha Stewart's so cool. Remember when she was uh, making food? Was, wasn't that her on TV with Snoop Dogg? Yeah, yeah, I think they still have their show right now. Yeah, yeah, her... Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg, I, I enjoyed that so much to see to see Snoop Dogg go from sleeping in cars, living in Long Beach, sleeping in cars, to on national television with Martha Stewart cooking meals and stuff. And you know, he was in, Snoop Dogg had to go through a lot of persecution too, just because he was a rapper. Mhm. You know. But yeah, gosh, it's it's. Oh. A, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, it's a great pairing between the two of them. And, um, I was kind of thinking today, too, about, um, like you were saying, like we don't necessarily have that many people listening to us right now. But right. I feel like there's some channels, if we could get at least even just you to be able to interview with them, might might help get more people to your channel. Um, I don't know if you watch, let's see, what's this guy's name? There's a guy in Scotland. It's called the Richie Allen Show, and he does a lot of different topics. He might be somebody that would talk to you about, I mean, anything you can come up with. I'm sure he's open to 
all sorts of topics. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say that I think would be another interesting topic beyond maybe just this phone call because it might take up time is that sort of the evolution of um, new film industries because, you know, I mean, L.A. is basically that town was like built around the film industry. But uh-huh. now we've got, you know, Austin, Atlanta, Minneapolis, and Austin especially, where I used to live, has always been known as they call it the live music music capital of the world. We've got South by Southwest, we've got Sixth Street, and when um, Austin Bergstrom moved and closed down, they turned those old airport hangars into film studios. There used to be all sorts of streets shut down when I lived there. They're making Austin, but you know it's one of those things where the industry, like some part of the industry, maybe a little bit people who are a little bit more independent or don't have the money saw it as an opportunity and they came there and they put that type of work there. But the, the influence it has on the culture of the city is different because it's like an afterthought. It's not the city was built on the way that Los Angeles was. That seems like you get a lot of insight from thinking about that. I think that's like, would be a great topic to cover sometime. It's just like the urban, urban planning influence of different industries because Los Angeles is, I mean, there's people that live there that don't care. They don't, they don't care. That's what's going on, but that's still like the main, it's the main employer, like the main employer of that city. Um, And I I find that kind of fascinating, to be honest. The whole city is built on entertainment. It is built on entertainment. One of my favorite areas is the Laurel Canyon area. And, That goes back, of course, to the 60s, and we were talking about, we had an amazing conversation uh, not too long ago about how a lot of good rock bands in the 60s got ruined because of the Vietnam War. The drummers, Mm -hmm. the the drum, you know, a lot of of garage, there were so many good garage bands in the 1960s. Some of them made it to the radio, others of them didn't, but they they were fantastic garage bands in the 60s in the L.A. area. And because, yeah. of the Vietnam, because of the Vietnam War, hey, a drummer would get drafted, the band had to break up. The lead singer would get drafted, the band had to break up. And mm-hmm. the Laurel Canyon area had some, some of the most best entertainment and celebrities you could ask for. And I remember one day I was walking by Jim Morrison's house, which right above Sunset Boulevard, you have Laurel Canyon Boulevard. And it runs all the way up to San Fernando Valley, of course, right? But uh, uh, I was over at the, their little store right there, the Laurel Canyon store, and I was hanging out, and I was talking to one of the people who worked there. And they were like, yeah, that's Jim Morrison's house over here. And this is – and the mamas and the papas used to hang out over there back in 67. And I used to – man, I – but the people down there on the Sunset Strip, they don't know anything about Laurel Canyon. Mm-hmm. They're so – they're so into the trends, uh, the modern trends of here here and today. If you ask them yeah. about something that, that happened beyond five years ago, they don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they, they don't, don't even know. know the history, the history of the place they're living in. Yeah, yeah, I like, you know, because I'm sitting there talking about Hale, Jar- Hale Jardine from the Beach Boys and, and Jimi Hendrix and, uh, of course, the Birds. And the Birds was like the first real good – uh, song that embraced the hippie movement that was mainstream. Remember that? Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Right, 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 right. And around that time, you had Richard Elpert, who later became Ram Dass, uh, in the hills. And, you know, they were exploring consciousness through the psychedelic, revol- through the psychedelic revolution. And mm-hmm. you, you had, you know, you... That was a really amazing time, the 1960s. And uh, the entertainment industry since then has changed so much. Like, you know, now they're bringing the vinyls back into the stores, which is cool because you can look at the album covers. But the entertainment industry has changed so much since that time. The movies have changed so much. The music has changed so much. Musicians don't even make records like they used to. Right. And Something that really, I was going to say real quick, this actually as a musician myself, growing up, um, you know, I was born in 1974, so, like, albums were still there even when tapes and CDs were coming out. We were making that transition. 
And I just remember, like, I love my albums. I love, like, the full sleeve with the lyrics printed on it. And the only reason I accepted compact discs is partly it's forced on you because you buy a new car and you don't got a tape player or anything anymore that you might have taped your records onto. Um, but at least the CDs were still a booklet with artwork and lyrics. And so it was like a mini album. And they even took that away. And the thing of it is, if you were to say, okay, well, it, you know, it's this room convenient, I'm going to do this over the internet. But if you want my album artwork and the lyrics, you need to own a printer. You need to have all the ink in the printer. You need to have the right type of paper. If you want it to be pretty, you might want photo paper instead of like regular typewriter paper. And that's like, just blows my mind that it's almost like the computer industry took over the entertainment industry because they now own the it mediums. Did. It did. It did. And 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 one of the things that startles me is what the what the computer, the internet, and this new age popcorn stuff has. Forty-year-olds look like they're fifteen-year-olds now. I'm not mm-hmm. joking. This, mm-hmm. this, there's something going on because I was. I remember one night I was on Hollywood Boulevard hanging out with some of my friends, and I was at what was it? It was a club. And they had they had a little hookah lounge and stuff like that, and I was hanging out one night, <clears throat> and I went over to one of the bars, and uh, <clears throat> you know I went in there, and I was hanging out, and some woman came in there, and you know I had a few drinks. I was with my friend, I put on like some older song and stuff like that, and I was asking the people questions. I was with my friends. We were talking about Laurel Canyon driving back up there, going back up there <clears throat> the next morning, and so I'm in the bar. And the, a woman comes in there, and she's like 40-something years old, and she has her hair uh, dyed purple or red or something like that. And mm-hmm. she's trying, and, she, and, she's, and she's like, this is a punk rock club. This is a punk rock bar. And, I, and I'm looking at her like, you, you know, you're 40-something years old. You look like you're 15. What's go, you know, what's going on here? Did the Internet do this to you? <laughs> <laughs> did, the, did the Internet do that to her? I don't I've never seen somebody 40 years old dressed like they're 15. Right. With right. holes That's, in their jeans um, and and she looked she looked she looked like a Puerto Rican hooker. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm laughing so hard. It's just it's kind of like you know I feel like a lot of people, even myself included, because I'm I'm pretty young looking, but that's my genetics, man. That's I can't help. But um, you know. I feel like youth is being extended because so many people under the current system, I don't know, but just like in the world, so many people are having their milestones taken from them. They're not succeeding. They're not following what used to be the life path of like you're an adult by this age, you have kids, you're married, you've got this and that. There's a lot of people that doesn't happen in the ABC way for them, and so they kind of stay like Peter Pan. Like, you know, I'm not old yet. I'm not old yet. There's still hope for me. And I, you know, and I feel for those people because I've been there. But, you know, as far as like the ways of dressing, um, you know, that is that is something that's like you would hope that maybe they would just change it or something. I've known people that are that age and they still dress that way. And I, I, I think of them sometimes when I'm dressing myself and I'm like, you know. If I wear this outfit and I meet somebody new and they ask me how old I am and I tell them I'm in my 40s, am I going to be embarrassed? Because if I'm going to be embarrassed, I better put on something a little bit different, right. you know. But that's that's kind of like the um, – and but in a weird way, it is kind of like the mentality because it's like if you're just free to, to do you, then maybe you are 50 years old and you still like wearing – T-shirts with like Superman on them. I mean, who whose business is it really? But you right. understand that people are going to look at you and say, "Why is that guy dressed that way?" You know. So right, right. that's all. That's a whole topic. I'm sorry, I just kind of went off on a tangent with that. But I mean, I've seen what you're talking about in myself and well, in other people. You know, it, it just wasn't. It just. It just. You know, it, it it was just shocking to see somebody 40-something years old devote their – it wasn't just the dress code. See somebody 40 years old devote themselves to punk rock like they're 15 or something like that. It just looked – it just threw me off, you know, because – Oh, cause yeah, yeah, mind, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, I mean, I didn't even I didn't even think about that, but that's like that. That was the whole thing of uh, music changing, like you're saying, like music changing and people sticking to sticking to the old ways. And I feel like yeah, you know, there was an article actually the other day I saw somebody wrote an opinion piece, and they said if you don't like if you don't like modern pop music, it's because your tastes are still stuck at 14. And as much as that hurts, I could relate to that because as I've grown older, I, f- I find it harder and harder to find music that I really like. And I do find myself going back to stuff that I loved when I was a teenager and saying, nobody's doing this. But, you know, maybe there's a point to that. Maybe their style or their approach to music was something that is a good thing that is not being done right now, and that's, that's why I like it, you know. Um mm-hmm. But I mean, I try to I try to listen to everything with an open mind, but I can definitely see how at a certain point, um, if technology again with the computers and stuff, if technology is changing too fast. I mean, think about our parents. It's technology think, is also. It, go on, go on. I was going to say, think about like you, you know, like Lou Rawls himself, like his style of music, and then if he like had somebody come over to his house with a laptop, and they were just like. Boom, boom, yeah, yeah, fuck this shit, fuck everything, like, and that's a dance song. And he has to sit there and go, that's a, that's a dance song. Right, right. You know, he, he can be like, what the and fuck, we, man? And, and, you know, people like Lou Rawls, Lou Rawls uh, grew up on the south side of Chicago, and Lou, Lou Rawls was a gospel singer. Mm-hmm. Lou, Lou, Lou Rawls grew up in the ghetto, he... Blue Rawls grew up in the projects, uh, you know, very, very quick learner. He was a gospel singer. Uh, he got involved in the music industry. And, you know, you see him with uh, Dean Martin and all those guys. He ended up in the film industry and doing music, you know. And, and uh, mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine those older guys back then using a laptop. And even right. when it comes to actors, I t- – I had the privilege of speaking to a, a, a well-known actor not uh, recently, a, a, a couple months ago, matter of fact. You remember Stephen Shellen? Yeah, I know Stephen Shellen. I've communicated with him a little bit. He did that Triggered yeah. or that, that Target movie? Uh, yeah, and he, well, he played, and Stephen Shellen played in a film, Gone in 60 Seconds, with Nicolas Cage. And 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 uh, I saw some of his art. He played He played in one of my most favorite movies. When I talked to him, I said, matter of fact, I think I'm going to call him soon. I'm going to call Steven soon. But when I talked to him, I said, man, I said, you're one of my favorite actors. And he started laughing. He said, what do you mean? I said, man, when I was a little kid, I used to watch HBO, and I saw your movie Stepfather with Terry O'Quinn. Remember the movie Stepfather with Terry O'Quinn? Hey, man, didn't he do, what did he do, like, one with Robert Redford? Like, one of those, um, either Robert Redford or somebody connected, like, in the 70s, like, a really famous really famous movie and I'm trying to think of the name but that guy that guy's awesome. If you if you talk to him, tell him hi. Um Yeah, yeah. I he, Terry o, Terry O'Quinn Terry O'Quinn is one of my most favorite horror actors. Terry O'Quinn played Stepfather one and two and, and part one. It was so funny, man. It's one of the that's one of the few horror movies you can laugh at. But when I first saw it I was like, Oh my God, this is insane. I I was watching <laughs> HBO and I I was, this was back in the early 90s, and Stephen Shellen played one of the main – co-starred in the movie. He, he was looking for his sister's killer, and it led him to Terry O'Quinn, who moved from family to family, and he portrayed himself as the perfect family man. And at the last second, he would just flip out and kill the whole damn family. And in part two, he ended up in a mental institution. He broke out of the mental institution. They made a part three – but in part three, he didn't star it. It was somebody else who played his role. But I told Stephen, o- Stephen Sheldon, I said, man, I'm not joking with you. Stepfather was one of my favorite movies growing up, and you co-starred that movie, man. And he started laughing. He he just started laughing. And it was so cool talking to him, you know. And uh, yeah. he, he his art is fabulous. You know, he's one of the few people in the entertainment industry you can really talk to, and he treats you like you're a uh, he treats you like you're one of his friends. You know, right. he's a really right. cool. He's the guy's been in movies with Nicolas Cage and all that stuff. But when you talk to him, he talks to you like you're like you know. He gives you the respect you deserve, man. 
and he's an awesome yeah, man, he, he's an awesome guy. He like he posted when he was talking to Ramola D. He like had a whole series of posts he put up, um, just kind of right. just sort of expanding on like his show or the movie he made and some stuff like that. And I remember I wrote to him because he brought up an issue, and I kind of was like siding with him on it and um, I sent him an email about it. He was just like, "Thanks, that's like really cool that you you understand right. what's coming." And I kind of wanted to pursue, like, talking to him more, but I didn't want to bother him, you know what I mean? So I just kind of let him be. But I was really excited that he actually wrote back. There's there's others of them out there, man. I remember I wrote Robert Robert England one time. He lives in Laguna Beach. Robert England wrote me back. (sighs) Robert England played Freddy Cougar. Um, Yeah. I know Buffy, Buffy the Body, the girl that was in the video with Tony Ayo. Tony Yeo for 50 Cent and all that stuff. I remember I wrote her back in the day. She wrote me back. You know, a lot of these people, if, hey, if you find an actor that you like and you're a fan, if you write them, a lot of times they'll write you back. Some of them will talk to you on the phone. You know, there's there's a lot of fruit there's a lot of fruit cakes out there, so they don't like to just talk to just anybody. You know, you know, but right. if, you, if if they see you're a legitimate fan, they'll talk to you. Uh, I'm a horror fan, so. You know, some of my favorite movies were horror movies, older movies, too. Like, have you ever seen the movie uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Not Are You Afraid of the Dark, Wait Until Dark. Sorry. Oh, I, you know what? I don't know. I don't know if I've seen that. If I did, I would have been, like, a real little kid. Okay, okay. Yeah, have you seen... That... Have, what era... Do you, you watch horror movies? Well, you know, when I was a kid, like the first, some of the first horror movies that I saw, um, and this was just by the luck of what was on just regular television, I got into the Tales of the Crypt, and um, I watched Toxic Avenger, and then after that, somewhere around that time, we got into like uh, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, The Scream, um, Final Destination, so we're kind of Logical thrillers, sometimes, you know, I mean, obviously a horror movie is, but some are a little bit more psychological than others, oh. like, I mean. Right, right, oh my God, like, like Nightmare on Elm Street, I know that I did a big thing on YouTube about the, my metaphysical breakdown of it, and I explained how the parents, did I do talk, I think I talked to you about this, how the parents were more responsible, the parents were actually <laughs> responsible yeah, dude, we were talking about that, and when I did some research on that part two you were talking about, did you know that um, in that that when supposedly the whole theme was is that Freddy Krueger needed a host body. He was trying to manifest into the flesh again, basically. But I feel like like we were saying, he never really like accomplished that. They didn't really like take that that idea to a to a conclusion. Right. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. From Freddy's Revenge, uh, he needed a whole body. Yeah, and the when you the the, night, the original house from Nightmare on Elm Street is in the area of Los Angeles known as Mid City, and a few houses down there's the house that they filmed Halloween, the Michael oh, Myers really? Halloween. Yeah, okay. the house. Okay, okay. This is this is so crazy. The house that they filmed Michael Myers Halloween is right down the street from the original Nightmare on Elm Street house in Mid-City, Los Angeles. And they only used the Nightmare on Elm Street house for the first two films, though. After that, they only used stage houses. Huh. Like for three, four, five, and six, when they show Freddy's house, it's not the same house. It's a stage house. Mm. But yeah. First, kind, of like, kind of like with Alfred Hitchcock, Psycho, they only used the real house for like the first one, and they used stage houses for the rest of them. Yeah. But, yeah, those like Halloween. That was one of my favorite movies. Uh, but Jamie Lee Curtis, she's still doing the Halloween. But the thing I like about Jamie Lee Curtis is she brought her mother into one of them. Remember her mother mm-hmm. was it Tippy Hendrix that did the birds? Oh no way! Is that? Oh wow! I didn't even think about that's that. That's Jamie Lee Curtis. Jamie Lee Curtis's mother is uh that's the one who did the birds, right? Tippy Hendrix. Okay, okay, yeah, that right. sounds right. I'm right. not looking at it, but it sounds right. Yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis's mother is a famous actress. 
who worked with Alfred Hitchcock and a bunch of other actors, and a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that Jamie Lee Curtis's mother, and in one of the last Halloween, I don't know if it was Halloween H2 or Halloween Resurrection, I forget, but they brought Jamie Lee Curtis's mother back into it. Then for a little second, they played the theme from the birds as she was driving off in that old car. <laughs> and, yeah, Jamie Lee <laughs> Curtis's mother is way more famous. You know, she's more famous than Jamie Lee Curtis. Right. But, yeah, those horror movies, there's so many. Matter of fact, I even saw her house. The woman from the birds, she owns, she owns a farm, an animal farm, out towards the desert. That's pretty interesting. That's kind of weird. Yeah, she she has tigers and lions and stuff. She owns a big animal farm in the L.A. area. And, well, let me ask and, you this, man. What do you think about, um, you know how the rest not in L.A., like if you want to buy a house or something, get a real estate agent, but what does Hollywood do as far as these stage houses? Is there like a group of searches out houses for a set and like, does their does their homeowners insurance change? Like, what happens when a house becomes a set house? Well, it's just a normal house. The Nightmare on Elm Street house is still a normal house. They'll even tell you, "Hey, one of my best friends uh, and that lives in the L.A. area, he owns a whole tour company. He owns the whole tour company." When I first started coming to Hollywood, he was I met him. He started taking me on tours. And then every year I would come back and we would keep hanging out, keep hanging out. And he's one of my good friends. Um, if I show up right now, you know, he, he, would, he would be like, man, you want a tour? And, you know, he told me, he said, man, it's just a normal house. The people living there, you know, don't go knock on the door. Be respectful. It's just a normal house. They don't have anything to do with Freddy Cougar. They don't have anything to do with, with you know, with Heather Lane Camp. From Nancy or whatever, it's just a normal house. Okay, so they they actually they actually let people live there. They don't just reserve it and keep it as the set house. Oh no no yeah yeah no no it's just a normal house now. But fans from all over the world go there though. I mean, if I owned the house, I'd be trying to turn it into a tour thing. Uh, The Brady Bunch house is just a normal house. I didn't realize that was real. That house actually exists. That's yeah, the Brady Bunch. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, it's like it's making me think about um, you know, the Golden Girls' house in Los Angeles, even though they're oh. like presenting themselves in Florida, but apparently that's in Los Angeles too. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't, hell, I don't even need. I don't even need a. I don't even need a celebrity. Like when you go down to Hollywood and Beverly Hills, they got the little celebrity map. I don't even need a celebrity map anymore. They got. You can go. A lot of these actresses. You know who Lucille Ball is. Yeah. Okay. She lives right next to Jack Benny. You know who Jack Benny is? Yes. Okay. Lucille Ball, she used to live right next door to Jack Benny. So the Lucille Ball house and the Jack Benny house are right next to each other. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure their family still own it. Jack Benny's family probably still owns the house. And, you know, Jack Benny, he, he he was an old actor too, boy. Did you ever see that small part Jack Benny played in that movie, A Mad, Mad, Mad World? Mad, 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 Mad World? Uh, no, I don't think I did. Oh, my God. You got to see that movie. That was one of my grandfather's favorite movies. It's A Mad, 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 Mad World. And there's a little bitty part in the movie where Jack Benny plays a role where he pulls up in this old car on the side of the street. And you got That's one of my favorite movies. You know, Jack Benny, he was an old actor. Uh but, yeah, you know, a lot of these, the houses that the actors lived in are still there, but the, the, actual, the actual set houses are still around. Yeah. You know, um, you know, remember that movie, The Exorcist? Yeah. I think in New York City, the apartment that the little girl lived at, um, the, the, well, I mean in the movie, in the movie, not in real life, the apartment where The Exorcist happened, that's still there. People go there and take pictures and stuff. It's just a normal apartment. Huh. That's pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. So, you know, you can you can you can go see any of the houses. You don't need it. You know, it's just if you're going to the, the if it's if it's a real set, then you have to have a pass to get in. 
in a second, mm-hmm. they put sets together and take sets apart, you know. Right. But, uh, what about, okay, what about, uh, what do you think, are you familiar with cam- movie cameras, like the old 8mm and 16mm? Um, to like a certain extent, only because, um, okay, so there's a format that didn't become really super popular, uh, no. which is, I didn't mean to make a pun, but it is called Super 8. Mm. So I remember when I was a kid, in the first time I saw Rattle and Hum, it's like U2 was up there filming themselves, and the whole thing for the first like half hour is completely in black and white. And then when they suddenly went to color, what the uh, – I think his name was Juno, somebody, Juno, Phil Juno, or Daniel Juno, who was their photographer. He, like, was using Super 8 for that, and so it was very highly color-saturated. So the, the jump from black to white was really dramatic. And um, I remember really liking that, and then oddly enough, the first video camera I ever got as a Christmas present happened to use what they call Hi8, which is a variant on Super 8. Um, mm. and that was that you know that that kind of film back then. Um, a friend of mine and I actually made a movie that ended up getting into a film festival, and I just remember thinking it was so amazing to me to see the color quality on that film. Um, even though it, again it was one of those formats that was going to get replaced by digital. Um, so what were you? What were your thoughts on that subject? I love the old 8mm and 16mm cameras. The digital stuff, I just don't like. You know, I, we right. use it. We have to use it. I'm impressed by it. I'm a hypocrite, I guess you can say. Uh, we're all using it. We all appreciate it. And the truth is we really can't do without it because this is all we know. We wouldn't, mm-hmm. I wouldn't know how to go into uh, – I wouldn't know how to go, you know, into into a camera laboratory and cut 16 millimeter. I wouldn't know how to do it, but right. I I like it though. It's I I love the old film, and I remember back in 2000, you know, I think it was 2000 or 2011, something like that. I went to a movie theater, and uh, you know, I asked them. I said, uh, I said, when it comes to the film, is it real film? And one of the guys said, you know what? This is the last year we're using real film. He said, after that, oh, really? it's going to be all digital. He oh, said, wow. and it's easier, too, because the film reels aren't as heavy. Mm-hmm. And even even when they have an old movie night, they just order the DVD. Right. I don't even bother going to the movie theater anymore. You know, the area I live at, one of the areas I live at, you know, Muskegon is a small area. There's a movie theater called the Cinema Carousel Theater. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I used to go in there. Last time I watched a movie, that I walked out. Not because of the movie theater, but because of the films. I don't like the films they're coming out with now. Mm-hmm. I can't. The films that come out now, I'd rather sit home, sit home and watch, you know, some old rerun or something on TV. Right. Right. It's it's the same thing too with music with between the analog, analog recordings versus digital recordings. There's no way around it. The analog is right. warmer captures more and uh, I mean I guess the best thing you could do is record your album on tape and then maybe convert it to a CD but I, I wouldn't record it I wouldn't record the whole thing digitally at all you know I, I just think you're missing something then that's just I'll probably always be that way because I'm from that generation other people might you're just fooling yourself there's no difference but if you grew up with it you know you know you can tell the difference, for sure. Right, right, right. Yeah, it was for sure. It was for sure. You know, I remember I I used to, uh, you know, I used to, I used to really, 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 you know, get into those older movies, older films. How they used to make the older films, and that's like 1930s Hollywood before the World War Two, uh, before they started making the war films, especially. Mhm. Mhm. And. You know, even today, you know, there's all sorts of researchers on YouTube talking about, matter of fact, up there in Laurel Canyon where they had that lookout mountain and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And they used to make war films up there. 
and there's a whole big stir about it amongst researchers about the Laurel Canyon era and the war films and stuff. But uh, the 1930s era, I think they made some really good films. There was a film called Devil Doll, uh, Drew Barrymore's grandfather, or was it her great-grandfather? Lionel Barrymore starred in the movie. You ever seen, you know who Lionel Barrymore is? The name rings a bell, but it's probably like, I probably just heard about him because of her. I don't think I've actually watched any of his movies. Yeah, Lionel Barrymore uh, starred in the movie. It was called The Devil Doll. And I cannot believe how they were able in the 1930s to create this movie. This guy was shrink. This guy went to the penitentiary for a crime he didn't commit. And he got out, and he was he learned to shrink dogs and shrink people, and he was using them to do his deeds. And he was trying to get back at the people who framed him. And uh, he, uh, the movie was this fascinating movie. It's called Devil Doll, and the, the you know no computers, no no special effects, but they were still able to shrink people and blow people up. I mean, it it it, it still it boggles me just as much as Terminator Two. How, how right. did they do it? Yeah, no, that's something, something that definitely that could be a whole show too. There's been some right. really great effects in some of those old movies that. You just don't even know how they did it without CGI, but apparently they had their own they had their own perception of magic back then, basically, and they they knew how to do it. Um, right. Yeah, we got to break one of those down sometime. That'd be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. How did how did they do it? How did they do it? And I, I I'm going back this summer when I get my money right. I'm going right back to Hollywood, and I'm gonna I love going there to ask. I like to you know. The amazing thing is, the amazing thing is, what they were doing back in the 30s and 40s, you can do now in your room. Right. You know, I do, I I make film all the time. I go on the internet, I talk to thousands of people around the world who watch it. I make film all the time. And I tell the truth. I don't have to lie and read from a plaque card, you know, or work for some crooked-ass media source. I can be myself and, and meet people and have friends, you know. Yes. Well, you man, know, uh, I was going to ask you what. Huh? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say at some point I might need to to jet because my dog is like demanding that I feed him. Um, so I don't know if you can hear him tapping around in here, but he's he's kind of he's kind of begging. So I might need to do something about that during a couple of minutes. Okay. Do you, you want to put the phone down and we wait, or you just want to call? Um, call back in a couple minutes. That might be the best thing because we're recording. Yeah, yeah, we need to edit this part out. Um, let me let me call back in like five minutes. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, man, I'll call you right back. All right. Bye right, bye. Yeah. This call is being recorded. Yeah. So, where do we leave off? You had to. Your dog had to. You know, you, we were talking you know, about uh, the Devil Devil Doll movie. Right, right. You know, that is such a good movie, man. The Devil Doll movie is one of the best movies I've ever seen. It's a 1930s movie. And 1930s Hollywood was a really interesting time. A lot of people mm-hmm. don't know about the real history of the silent picture industry in Hollywood. It's far more exciting than the 90s and the two, early 2000s. Um, the style, I, I look back to like Laurel and Hardy, Harold Lloyd, uh, Charlie Chaplin, like the Charlie Chaplin movie, The Great Dictator. They tried mm-hmm. to show the public what Hitler was up to in Europe. Uh, you know, the communists, you know, the, you know, Joseph Stalin, during the time of the silent motion picture, Joseph Stalin uh, was very involved with with uh, some of the directors at that time in Hollywood. Um, the same director, yeah, sure. The, some of the same directors who did uh, films in America in the early 1900s were some of the same directors that did the propaganda for Stalin. And Adolf Hitler loved radio. 
Adolf Hitler was one of the biggest radio speakers of our time. Adolf Hitler was in show business. Adolf Hitler was an actor. Mm-hmm. He, you, you know, okay, you know who, you know who, Von Liebensberg, and you ever heard of Richard uh, Richard Wagner, the, the pianist? Uh, yeah. All those all yeah. those plays they were doing um, in the early 1900s in Germany and Austria and whatnot. That was show business. Adolf Hitler was all involved in show business, and he, but he ended up doing radio, just like Joseph Goebbels was the proper. Joseph Goebbels was the uh, minister of propaganda. He loved the Nazis loved radio more than anything. <laughs> the communists loved film, and the, uh, Joseph Stalin uh, loved. Joseph, they made all sorts of movies in the Soviet Union, and some of the directors in Hollywood were also involved in Stalin's propaganda team in Moscow. And I think you, know, you so, broke you broke up for a second on my end. Um, I think you were talking about the Soviets. Soviet right, film, I, was, right? I was talking about Adolf Hitler was in show business when Adolf Hitler was around. Radio was real big. This is way before our time. Radio used to be the biggest thing before film. Right. And television didn't come out to like, you know. I guess if you really had the money for it, you could have got a TV in 1947. But nobody really was watching TV till the 50s. Uh, but the Nazis loved radio. And so Adolf Hitler was in show business with Joseph Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda. The Nazis put out some really good films, too. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, Like Himmler, during his uh, Himmler, during his expedition to Tibet, uh, they did films where they went to Tibet and they hung out with the Buddhists, and lo and behold, they brought Buddhists back to Berlin. Buddhism was becoming one of the Nazis' Main religions. And oh, really? Yeah, yeah. They were they were the Grand Mutaf or Mutif. Uh, uh, Hitler was involved with the Arabs, and they were bringing. You know, the, the Nazis love show business. They love filming stuff. They loved radio, but radio was the biggest thing. Then the communists did marvelous work with film. Uh, if you can go back and watch Lenin and, and Stalin, all these people in film. And the same directors and producers that were in the early days of Hollywood, of course, were Jewish. Who does the best film? Jewish people. Mm-hmm. You know, Jewish 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 people do some of the best film work. Everybody knows how talented Jewish people are when it comes to the arts. The same people involved with Stalin were the, some of the same people involved with the early directors in Hollywood. And that, and a lot of people have not really gotten into the. See, people don't know show business. They don't know, you know, what, what it really took to to put entertainment together and you get these films out there to the rest of the world. It took a lot, and so, mm-hmm. you know, that's why when I when I go watch films, I like watching the early 1900s films, the 1930s films, because I enjoy the history behind the films. You know who you'd probably really be interested in? Have you heard of uh, Lenny Reifenstahl? Lenny who? L- Lenny Reifenstahl. She was actually – she was a woman who um, was one of Hitler's – eventually one of Hitler's main propaganda filmmakers. Okay. And there's a whole documentary on her. I actually saw it in, um, I don't know, like 1996, 97 because it was – it became relevant to an English class I was taking – and there was a film festival, and they happened to have it showing on campus. And um, it was really interesting to hear her story because she she became like one of his like right hand people as far as some of the propaganda movies and the filming and the directing of them. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and and I think 1930s art in Germany should be looked at. Um, the world has some sort of view. Like no one's supposed to care about German history or German art because of the Holocaust, and although the Holocaust was horrible, a lot of terrible things happened. Uh, we should not shun our back from it. We should embrace it, and also look beyond the horror that people went through in the Holocaust and find out who were these artists in Berlin back in the 1920s. 
uh, who, mm-hmm. who you, you, you know, Ber, uh, Berlin, Germany, and the rest of, of Germany had some brilliant film filmmakers, some brilliant artists. Um, when the Nazis came along, a lot of them, through choice or through force, had to work for the politics of the time. But, you know, there's still some, like my grandfather played piano. He used to play, he used to listen to some of Richard Wagner's music. Richard Wagner was one of the top uh, pianists during the reign of the Nazis. Mm-hmm. He, they, some, hey, in Israel, they didn't even want to play his music. Right. Because because of his affiliation with the Nazi Party, but it was still show business. It was still, you know, it was still show business. And uh, have you ever seen that film, that horror film, Puppet Master? Oh, uh, well, say that one more time because you're still cutting out a little bit. Have you ever seen the horror film Puppet Master? Uh, no, I don't think I've seen that. Okay, well, Puppet Master is a horror film, and it was. Put out by Blue by Full Moon. Full Moon is like a small film company. They're lot well, they're larger now, but back in the late '80s, early '90s, they started a Puppet Master series. And Andre Toulong, who was hiding his magic from the Nazis, uh, he ended up killing himself when they were looking for it, and he hid his magic with the puppet. And with okay. the, it's ancient Egyptian magic, it actually has to do with the pineal gland. The chem- getting the chemical out of the pineal gland, the dimethyltryptamine. Somehow, through Egyptian magic, he animates the puppets and brings them to life. And uh, it, it, there's like a whole... I mean, they're still making Puppet Master films, but it was films based around, you know, the Nazis at the time. And when I first started watching Puppet Master, that's what really got me interested in German films. And that was when I was a little kid. You know, that's pretty interesting. I used to, I used to, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Oh, I even speak bit, a little uh, German. Did it come on like regular TV or was it on cable? It came on HBO. Okay. It came on. It came on HBO. You know, and um, but after after I watched it as a child, later on in my life, I'd see German films, and I'd sit back and watch them, and they got really, good, they had some really good films. They are making over there, you know. I mean, of course, mm-hmm. you got to read the subtitles, but yeah, definitely. Do. And there's just some type of crossover. I mean, that'd be another whole subject too. To just look at the evolution of Hollywood during the war, right? I mean, right, right. Know, like, yeah, they participated, and then they participated with us. And it's like, from what from my own inside knowledge, what I understand is that they're in the CIA. They have liaison. There's always a liaison to the film industry, a liaison to the music industry. And I say that, I mean, not just one. There's probably more than one. But, um, you know, that's that's kind of how some of the um, some of the films now that come out that have, like, the predictive programming in them and things like that get made is that somebody from the government comes to them and tells them, well, look, we want you to make this movie and we want this to be in here. And to me, it's like, in some way, they're kind of they kind of are doing a service by preparing for things, but they're also they also seem to know they know more than they're saying. And so, when you have an industry that's not supposed to be an official government industry or, or organization that's out there with some of this information, you know, I kind of I kind of have a disagreement with that. Well, you I don't you know. I... Right, I don't know too much about that. I just know about the films, but I, I do know in any area of the world, um, you know, you're going to have people. You're going to you're in any in any area of the world. You're going to have the country involved with filmmaking. For the simple fact is, you can scare people. Remember when Orson Welles came out with War of the Worlds? Right. Orson Welles, or they let they let Orson Welles go on the air. And he came out with War of the Worlds, and people started committing suicide everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the 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 you know, you would think if you have a country and you have a government, they're gonna want to know what's going on, because if something like that could happen back in the 30s, what do you think can happen now? Somebody could come out with some stuff on the 
on the news or on television and scare the hell out of people, and half the country will be, you know, trying to commit suicide. So that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, I mean, right. that aspect of it is disturbing. But, um, but it is interesting to even just look at uh, the, the movies that they put out that were sort of part of their campaign and as to whether those movies were actually good movies. Some of them were. Some of them were really good movies, and some of them were more like after-school specials, you know. But right, they were well, definitely that, I did a film. I did. I did a. Uh, I did a presentation the other night talking about the Cold War, and I was explaining that in the in the television show The Brady Bunch. Uh, if you pay attention, it's a Cold War film based on capitalism, where the Brady Bunch was casted to play a role of always being happy, always smiling. They always had enough to eat. Uh, if there was an issue, the father could handle it. The basic common logic. Um, and that was the idealism that the, that capitalism was promoting at that time during the Cold War, late 60s. Uh, this is when people were still hiding under their desk, still doing the under-the-desk drills uh, in case the bomb dropped. People still had bomb right. shelters in their basement. So, And a lot of people didn't get that. That television shows like The Brady Bunch, The Partridge Family, uh, uh, even even shows like What's Happening, with Freddie Stubbs' rerun, how he wears that little b- red beret cap. Re- you know, uh, shows like this were oriented for towards the Cold War, you know. Right. So whoever else was looking at American TV, they're going to see capitalistic ideals. That's always, you know, that's always been a thing going on, you know. Right. And, and you know, that's just... That's just something that that's just something that's out there, you know. Uh, if you look at German, not German TV, but if you look at uh, Chinese television or Russian television, you're going to see the same stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't think even a news anchor man. I don't think they can say whatever they want to say. They have to read a script word for word. Right. Right. And exactly. I, Right. It was like the Orson Welles scenario, War of the Worlds, where people start committing suicide. You have to have, you, you know, I, hey, you're not going to work in my corporation and get on television and say whatever you want. You're not smart enough to do that. You know what I mean? I mean, that's probably how they feel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not intelligent enough. You run a newspaper, you're not intelligent enough to add your opinion. This is what you're going to say. And so, mm-hmm. you know, but going back, Decades ago, though, we used to have a time where journalists could say what they want to say. Did you see those newspaper articles I presented on the 1950s? Uh, I don't think so, no. Back in the early 1950s, uh, there was newspaper articles coming out about flying saucers from mainstream, from mainstream news, new, new, you know, from mainstream news companies, you know? And uh, the Air Force was on there. Everybody was in the newspaper talking about flying saucers and going to Washington. I mean, this, this isn't a joke. I'm serious. Right, no. Most, I remember most, people, well, don't, most people don't know that. Well, ever, ever since Roswell, it was like a thing for right. a good amount of time, right? And right, to this right. Day, yeah, ever since. I mean, it's not as prevalent now. They still sometimes do it, but they usually do it when there's like a, oh, like a meteor or a bolide or something that like some cop catches on his dash cam, and they're like, hey, look, man, over uh, over this small town over here, we have this thing playing, and that's pretty much it. Um, so you know, it's like I, I agree with me. There's not really, there's not really journalism anymore in TV news mm-hmm. to a large extent. I mean, maybe if they're doing like, um, oh, you know, if it's like Channel Seven, like it's, it's a seven on your side, and we found out this roofing company is scamming you. Like those are pretty legit. Those are real investigative news stories. But anything that's happening on a grander scale, no. It's like I think they're reading it. Their editors are just reading what the network wants them to say, and probably the, the NBC, ABC, CBS, 
is going to influence everything that your local news station says to you, pretty much. Right, 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 right. That's why I don't watch television. I don't read the newspaper. I don't watch television. I don't believe anything. The, the, even the local chronicle here in Muskegon, I don't even look at it because I know there's nothing in it worth reading. Uh, most mm-hmm. of the information I read is, is, you know, alternative media specialists, uh, people, you know, online who give alternative media stories. Like I listen to you more than I listen to Fox News or CNN. You know. Right. I, 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 right. You know, I, I don't. I don't ever listen to them. I mean, when I do read newspapers, I'm reading newspapers like, like from the '40s. You know. Yeah, exactly. You have to because if you want to trace, like the, you want to trace where all this stuff started and it's happening right now. I mean, there's one way to do it. Because mm. everything, everything's obfuscated, everything's covered up. But if you go back and you read papers, watch movies from, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you start to get an idea of who the players are, and you kind of start to see how one thing led to another. Right. 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 Yeah, yeah. I just did. I was just doing some research recently. I just presented a video about the Cold War, and you know, down around where Cuba is, you know, there's pyramids at the bottom mm-hmm. of the ocean. And I oh, was presenting my yeah, underneath well, the Bahamas, there's pyramids from Atlantis. Which uh, was which one was this? What what part of the world was this? Is this more close to South America, or was this the other? No, this is this is by Cuba, by Cuba okay. on the bottom of the floor, the o- by the bottom of the ocean floor, in the Caribbean, by the Bahamas, by the Bermuda Triangle. There's pyramids on the bottom of the ocean floor, and this is on Google Images. This, this isn't anything secret. Like the whole world can just go on Google Images and look at it, and it never ceases to amaze me. You know, like people sit there and watch Michael Jackson on the news for four months. And they watch Anna Nicole Smith on the news for four months, but nobody's talking for four minutes on the news about pyramids at the bottom of the ocean floor. Right. And why are there pyramids on the bottom of the ocean floor? Where did these pyramids come from? Who built them? They're on the bottom of the ocean floor. Why aren't people talking about it? You know, right. and obviously this goes, these pyramids are older, uh, are, are, are similarly related to the Giza pyramids. And that being said, it's obvious during the Cold War, uh, the Americans were down there looking at these pyramids, and the Russians also wanted to know what were these pyramids about. I think inherently that was a big aspect of the Cuban Missile Crisis was securing these pyramids because the ancient Atlanteans had technology. So mm-hmm. if, if, if the Chinese got them or if the Russians got them, that would be a serious thing. Hey, right. there could be technology or information in these pyramids that can that can get you, you know, to to, to the moon, or that can get you to Mars. Whoever gets this information in these pyramids, which there's pictures of it on Google, can get that technology. And so I think that was a big part of the Cold War. And I had presented a presentation on that, and I I just don't know if I'm still trying to figure out. Is the public too stupid to get that? Because they're mm-hmm. talking about Anna Nicole Smith for four months. Right. You see what I'm saying? That's why I don't watch the I, news, because there's nothing in the news worth watching. No, because there's nothing There's nothing that comes from it that actually tells anybody what step can you take as an average person. You know, whereas what you're saying... If they were talking about that, I mean, you know, that's something that could potentially interest a lot of people, and maybe maybe nothing big comes of it, but somebody out there is inspired to pursue archaeology, and then they go there, and they look at it, and they're another voice that has seen it firsthand. So most of the stuff that we're fed is just, well, this is what happened today, and uh, this person's saying about it, and never mind, it's going to be 62 degrees tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of how it goes. Right. Right. They're too stupid. The public is too stupid to have real information. They don't just, they don't, they don't know how to think or read. And and that's the problem with alternative media is only a small percentage of the people watching it, you know, 
can actually process real information. Right. And and so, but yeah, but you know, so uh, in the movies and going back to what you were saying, Josh, in the movies, movies do three things: they show you what has happened, they show you what is happening, and they show you what's going to happen. And so you can learn a lot by watching films. Even I'm so, I'm still watching films from the 1950s about extraterrestrials. Mm-hmm. You know. Did you ever check out that Jack Kevorkian? Oh, did Kevorkian? I know about Kevorkian, the, the Anastasia or euthanasia guy. Yeah, that shows you. That shows. That shows you how that shows you how insane the medical industry in Michigan is. <laughs> the medical in- industry in Michigan is like the laugh of the. But have you the Jack of Orkin? What what was his deal? I don't know. I mean, that's like that goes back to when I was a kid. You know, we used to uh, we we used to not like joke about it, but we were just kind of like, you know, this is uh. This is pretty serious. It was pretty pretty scary to like see that actually was being considered, but at the same time, when you'd watch the people that were asking for him to do it, like the really severe cancer patients, you know, if he wasn't if he wasn't doing it, they might have done it to themselves. You know, is the only thing to think, because there are some things that are just too, you just have a choice between like a quick, like a religion. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't you take your way out? Well, I remember my, you know, my grandmother was an attorney. She was, she didn't, she used to talk about the Kevorkian case, and I, I couldn't believe that the state of Michigan was allowing a doctor to, to actually kill people. I mean, it, it is it is a national debate. Should a doctor have the right to kill somebody just because they want to commit suicide? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a serious question. And I knew somebody who was in the uh, penitentiary with Jack Kevorkian. And, I mean, Michigan has more prisons than any other state. But uh, I, I know somebody who was in prison with Jack Kevorkian, and they said that all the guards in the prison wanted to steal Jack Kevorkian's T-shirt and anything with his number on it. When you go to prison, you get a prison number, and they put your prison number on your underwear. They put it on your T-shirts. They put your prison number everywhere. And so the guards in the prison in Michigan wanted to get steal his, his belongings so they can put his prison number uh, they can they can take his stuff and put it on eBay and sell it. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow, that's messed up. That's super messed up. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 boy, that's that's crazy. And so a lot of times people say you're from Michigan. They say, what do you think of Jack of Orkin? I don't mm-hmm. know. That's just the medical industry in Michigan. Right. But, uh, <laughs> no. But, uh, it's like what's you know, it's just kind of like I just wrote to a guy today because I was irritated. It's a legislator down here that like he's anti-abortion, but his solution to it is anybody who gets one doesn't matter how doesn't matter how you got pregnant, you have a death penalty if you get one. So basically, if your dad does it, and it's your dad's kid, he didn't care how it affects your life or how you're going to raise it. If you get an abortion, you get the death penalty. You get a needle put into you, you're dead. And to me, that's just like that's just a sick thing, and I feel like that's like, you know, as again, where film can help, because when we get in these cultural situations where people are making these outrageous suggestions, film is a way to, like, play out the possibilities of your of the consequences of your action on, like, many, many different levels. Right. And, right. and like you were saying about the Brady Bunch, I don't know if you knew this, but, um, in the movie Salt with Angelina Jolie, um, as a part of her training as a Russian sleeper agent living in the U.S., that's one of the shows that she watches, and they make a huge emphasis on that grid that they put all their pictures in. And what I find interesting about modern news right now is that is every person that Trump fires, every time somebody gets knocked out of the Trump administration, they use that exact Brady Bunch grid as a visual to show all the people right. that are getting eliminated. You know, and that's no coincidence. There's no coincidence between, I mean, those things are all on purpose. And it's right. real weird to sit here and watch it and see, you know, some graphic designer 
made that knowing probably exactly what they were doing, and if they didn't know, then their editor knew it. They're they're editorializing with the stuff that they put out, and, and in a way, they're making film, even though they're lying to us. And like that's like a blurred line that I think is. Somebody's going to have to come out and do something about it because I feel like it's kind of is, is what is being used against our country to polarize people. And if people are getting polarized over stuff they don't even understand. They, they think they've got the news and they don't. And they go out and they hate people for it. You know, and that's not serious. That's serious politically. Right, right, right. Well, it's, it's, it's quite a story, you know. Uh, I, 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 like I was saying, I was, I was, I don't even, when I, when I watch, well, you're know, looking at the world, you don't even know what you're looking at anymore, you know? Mm-hmm. People look like something from the creature from the Black Lagoon, you know? I saw a guy the other, I saw a guy the other day, he looked like It. <laughs> you remember It with Stephen King, that clown or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> he came walking out of the store, he looked like It from the clown. You know, I don't oh, know what's going on. Yeah. But, you, you know, <laughs> the alternative media has provided a solid place for us to get the facts, you know, and be able to communicate with each other. And uh, we I was, we were starting off in the last episode talking about the, the entertainment industry. And do you feel people are overly entertained, like overly stimulated? Do you, how do you feel? Do you think there's way too much entertainment? Or it's almost yeah. like ancient Rome, like a circus I, I, of feeding, feeding people lions like, and stuff. Yeah, man. It's like, well, it's like it's everywhere because it, I feel like we're in a um, – it's, it's like because it's commercialized, there's like a glut of like having to put content out there without caring whether it's actually good. And mm-hmm. so some people are trained to view – well, it's like when you're a kid and you get that star that you – when you look back on it 20 years – from now, you're like, you know what? That song was like not that great, but I was so attracted to that person. It didn't matter. Like, there's mm-hmm. a little bit of that going on. There's a little bit of that like um, teenage hormone thing to it. And as for the adults, adult tastes have kind of shoved into a different media category. Well, this is adult alternative radio, or if you're over 25, all you listen to is NPR. Um, and and uh, adult music is not. Um, presented sometimes with the same fanfare as the next up-and-coming young person where it's all about their youth and their beauty and how amazing is it this person is only this age and this is their music. And the sad thing about that is is that most of that is manufactured. Most of those people, maybe they've got one talent they can sing or they just are really good looking and they can kind of sing. And they've got a whole army of people who are not getting credit, who are writing their music, writing their lyrics, coaching them on their vocal melodies, getting them through their videos, and those people are like the anonymous ghost writers of the society who don't get any credit off it whatsoever, but I guess if they're officially employed, hopefully they're getting paid well, you know. But yeah, we got we got the voice, we got Britain's got talent, America's got talent, we've got reality T V shows where you want to watch somebody knock their teeth out. We've got honey boo boo. <laughs> You know, if you would look at it, you would just you'd think that the Americans are kind of sick sometimes. And you look at some yeah. of them, you're like, why do you, why do I, you want to watch I, this, man? I I it's like they can't connect dots or something. Right. It's like it's like you know it's like they can't it's like the people cannot connect dots. They can't think for themselves. You know, I don't I don't watch the news for nothing. I do my own research. You know, I don't believe nothing they say on television or the newspaper. I do my own. And, and uh, you know, I hope in the future people go get a library card because I got a library card, and I love my library card. I ain't, I'm not giving my library card up. I like to go to the library and get books and photocopies of books and sit down and read and stuff. And, you know, you sit there and you see these morons staring at their iPhone, text messaging half the day. And they right. don't, you know, they, they've only read a, a half a book in their life, you know. Exactly, man. And you know what? That's why – that's part. Of, that's part actually part of how I found that book I'm sending to you. I was actually thinking about my public library and about how – because it's a small town, um, you know, we've got kind of limited hours. 
and I was thinking to myself, yeah, I want to see. I, well, there's some books I want to read because one of my favorite bands, their lead singer, is really into this author that discover stuff. Sometimes I was like, I want to find that lady's books, and so I went online and I said, Hey, you guys have a online catalog? Yes, they do. I typed her name in. They've got none of her work, but on one of the searches I did, I just the last name, and for some reason, just her last name brought up like all these books that were about mind body connection and that's where I saw that book sending you. And that was just that was an accidental search. I just got lost in the library and found something I wasn't looking for. But I didn't I but I was looking for but didn't know I was looking for it, if that makes sense. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're, you know, in the in the books, it's like you got little book but it's like it's almost like there's little gnomes or trolls in the library trying to get all the real books because when you go down there and you look for good books, sometimes they don't even have the old books they're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain books out there that they're trying to get out of the library. And that's not a conspiracy. Even book ad, there's there's, there's little groups of book advocates complaining about how there's missing books, you know, uh, and, and we're trying to get to a point to where, you know, we can have as much knowledge as possible. You know, I don't like reading those PDFs. I like to read yeah, real books. That'd be, and that's the thing too. Like some of the times, some of the books I wanted the most, it would be like somebody checked it out like six months ago and never brought it back. Basically, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Yep. 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 And it's almost scary because, like, remember Albert Einstein? They were saying yeah. they were saying Albert Einstein was crazy, and he was one of the most brilliant people of our time. Same thing with Ezra Pound. They were saying, hey, didn't Ezra Pound end up in a mental institution for 12 years or something? And you I know, think he was, so. Yeah, well, Ezra they, Pound was a girl. Ezra Pound was like a, a pseudonym for a woman, right? Oh, was it? Yeah. Yeah, I know Ezra Pound was a writer, but didn't, didn't, didn't she end up? Or whatever, didn't you end up in the joint or something? Or in the, or in the institution? Same, so it's like, same thing. I need to look that up. There was, there was a black man in Mississippi during the Civil Rights era, and he wanted to go to college, and they put him in a mental institution just because he wanted to go to college, because he liked oh, to wow. read and study. Yeah, that's how bad it is. That's one of the, the stupidity and the insanity is, 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 is appalling. I'm appalled. I'm I'm appalled yeah. at the stupidity in this country. But okay, so we we're looking at the entertainment industry in the future. You know, I would like us. To, I want I want to get into some stuff. Have, are you familiar with microbiology? Yeah. You ever heard of the nematode? A nematode. A nematode. Uh, there's a nematode. Yeah. There's some sort of funk. There's some sort of, uh, um, I want to say not virus, but the nematodes are on all the roots of all the plants. Mm-hmm. Ne- Have you heard that before? Well, I didn't. I didn't know their relationship to. Um, so there were there were there were no worms though, right? They're they're yeah they're yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And they're very important. They're important to ecology. There's something that you can actually, I think you can buy. I don't know if it's the uh, diatomaceous earth that helps those or not, but they're very important for gardening. Um, but what, what's your what's your information on that? Is there like something going on? I just or? no. I just started looking into it when, when it comes to microbiology. Uh, you have you have you know algae and fungus and and uh, I, I I'm just fascinated by microbiology and you know a few hundred couple hundred years ago or whatever if somebody would have said hey there's microscopic life that you cannot see with your eye on your finger people would have thought they would have thought you were crazy right but somebody invented a microscope and now you can see microscopic life through a microscope. And that just fascinates me, you know. And I wanted to do, you know, I think I'm going to buy myself a microscope in the coming up 
and I'm, I'm really getting into microbiology. Uh, microelectronics is something I've been looking at coming out of the Cold War. The microelectronic companies and, you know, how, how they would put, you know, the electrical boards together. And mm -hmm. that's just fascinating me. I was thinking maybe in the future we can do one on science, uh, you know, a subject, and possibly have some alternative, some, some, some references that most people haven't heard of. That would be pretty interesting, actually. I mean, um, congrats to you if you get that microscope, too, Mandy. A lot of topics. Um, it's just good to talk about because it is demonstrating, like, critical thinking, you know. Um, and um, nano, like things like nanotechnology, not just micro, but nano. Um, I'll try to find this article I read a long time ago. But when I worked at UT, we had a we had a doctor in the biomedical engineering department who was working on the nanotechnology side of things, and she was describing how you know, they were getting like living single cell organisms. I mean, not just bacteria, but other types of stuff to build these artificial wires. Like you ran a bacteria to, to deposit selenium, calcium, gold, silver. You could get it to sit there and deposit it in exactly the blueprint of your circuit board if you wanted it to. And I was just like, what? And she, she just she pulled out an abalone shell, and she said it's the same way that uh, sea creatures form their calcium shells. It's like a process of accretion where they lay these pieces down. And um, and I just thought that was fascinating. That's like a whole – that's a whole separate area. It's like we can have a lot of talk about that. Okay. Well, we'll have to come back sometime soon, and, you know, we'll, I'll get some references. We'll talk off the line and get some stuff together. Maybe okay. Maybe we can bring somebody on who specializes in, in a certain area, and okay. uh, we can move forward. You know what I mean? It would be cool to have, like, yeah. you know, somebody, you know. Um, you know, I just thank you so much, you know, and – I get people all the time be like, "Hey, you know, uh, thanks, thanks for the, thanks for coming out." I got people all the time. They thank you so much that video you did, that video you guys did. You know, you, I didn't even know about that. And I always tell people, you know, leave a couple dollars behind, you know, so we can get some books right. and stuff. And you know, I mean, if people can pay twelve dollars to go watch a movie that they really have no, <laughs> go watch some old, some silly ass movie at the movie theater. That isn't that it, that isn't worth that isn't worth a buck, you know. They can they can certainly donate five or ten dollars ten dollars to some real knowledge and information. Exactly, and you know what to that end. I mean, we're not kidding you guys. Like one of the books I spent my own money today to buy myself a copy of this, buy Jamil a copy of this book that is called yeah. "Where the Mind Meets the Body," Type A. The Relaxation Response, Psycho Neuroimmunology, Biofeedback, Neuropeptides, Hypnosis, Imagery, and the Search for the Mind's Effect on Physical Health. It's kind of a long title, but this guy, uh, Harris, Harris Dienstry, is the author, and these are actual studies where doctors have found a huge impact of the mind on the body. And this book, you know, that we're, I'm sending him, this is like you get a good condition used copy for between $3 and $6. You know, it's not like it's not like somebody has to you know send like thirty bucks or something. It's like real cheap. So anything anybody can do would be awesome. Right on, right on, right on. Anything anybody can do would be would be would be marvelous. And you know, we suffer. People like us suffer ad hominem attacks. They can't really hurt the information we deliver because it's based on fact as well as well polished information. So they always try to make us look bad because they can't make because they can't make, they can't discredit real knowledge and facts. So they try to ruin our image to make up right. for what to, right to make up for their own stupidity. And so, you know, we tell people be supportive. Let people know what we're doing. Tell your friends. They say, hey, you know, we heard some information on the interview we think is worthy, you know, listen, put us on podcasts while you're at the library and stuff, you know. 
Yeah, you know, share share the link to this. You know, share it on your Facebook page. Share it to one of the groups that you're in, and right get on. more people to listen in. Right on, right on. Well, uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna um you know put this together for us, and uh, we'll you know we'll be back together uh, soon. Um, I'll contact more off the line. I'll of course get back in touch with you. You know, so we can figure out what books we want to get for the next for the listeners on the next show. But uh but, but you know, we'll be back with some new stuff soon. All right, man, that sounds great. Um yeah, contact me if you want to brainstorm and I'm gonna I'm gonna head out and probably do dinner because it's it's getting close to five thirty here in Texas. Oh, I want to say something real quick before we jump off. Remember that yeah. movie remember that okay, speaking of uh, speaking of Lionel Barrymore, Drew Barrymore's grandfather, great grandfather, whatever. You remember we were talking about she was in that movie called Firestarter, and she was using pyrokinesis to light stuff on fire. Right. People don't. People. I want people to go out and go on YouTube. One of my friends he sent me an email and said, "Thank you so much for talking about that." He said, "I've been trying to make sense out of these Chinese uh, qigong masters." Who can light objects on fire? Oh, really? Chi- yeah, Chinese qigong masters who light objects on fire. This is pyrokinesis. And Project Centerling, which was a well-known government project who was into psychic phenomena, a telekinesis, pyrokinesis. Uh, I was talking about that, and I, and I sent and a friend of mine sent me a clip of it and said, this is pyrokinesis. And it's a Chinese Qigong master lighting newspapers on fire and all sorts of stuff on fire with his bare hands. That's pretty interesting. We got we have to do something on that one too because yeah, yeah, yeah pyrokinesis is a real phenomenon, and that gets in it the spontaneous human combustion too. But I'll, we'll be back, Josh. I gotta just like you. I'm gonna get off here and edit this down, but we'll be back soon. Okay, that sounds good, man. I'll talk to you again soon. Okay. All right, Josh. All right, bye.